down to the nitty-gritty in high school basketball. It's the third round of the playoffs with the ladies in Class 4A defending regional champ Fredericksburg. Played Navarro at Littleton Gym last night. Third quarter battle in Billy's in control. Christian Hartman. The three, 39-25. The Panthers claw their way back. Tatum Harborough drives, gets the foul, counted at one. She finished with a game-high 22, but Fredericksburg answers right back. Madison Fronson for the three. It's good, plus a foul, off ball foul, results in a five point play. Ella Hartman calls her own number right to the hoop. She had 17. Fredericksburg sweeps their district rival 62 41. They're a solid team. They really are. We had to work for it. It wasn't an easy game for us, but playing them in district made it a little bit more difficult because they know everything that we're going to do. So you have to come up with some new things that they don't know. Best nickname around. The Battling Billies will next take on the winner of the Somerset Beeville Jones matchup in the regional semifinals this Friday. The Lytle Pirates are into the third round of the playoffs, thanks in large part to their defense. These young ladies, they eat it, they sleep it, they dream it. It's all about defense. Boy, do they embrace it. They love to press and create turnovers. And coming up for next for them in Class 3 playoffs is their district rival from Cotulia, the Cowboys, a team the Pirates beat twice during the regular season. We played them twice, so we already know how they play, how they are, and um, we're gonna. We watch film on them, so we work. And we know how to break it down okay. what they're not good at, so we can work on that at practice, and hopefully take it up after the game. I definitely think it will be like competitive. They'll come to play. We watched film. We prepared. We've. I think we'll do fine. <laughs> It'll be fun. We beat them twice in district. Um, it was, it, it's a good team, really good team, and um, I think it'll be a good matchup. The um, thing is that they know how we play, we know how they play, so we just got to switch things up a bit and play our game, but better. For her career, Fizz has 488 steals. She'll pick your pocket. Lida will play Catulia tomorrow night, six in the Class 3A regional quarterfinals in Seguin. Santos, talk to and rodeo, bull riding back in action. Last night, five of the 11 rides went the distance. Here's Jeff Askey spinning around and around and around Frontier Coffee New Grounds, and that's a percolating ride. He earned an 80 on that ride. He's still going. There you go. Get off that thing before it hurts you. You only have to go eight seconds. Look how calm that bull was. Nice ride and chill. Here's seven-time world champion Sage Steele Kimsey riding Moonflower. Breaks off an 87-point ride. They were riding him last night. This is what a seven-time champ does. Final Cowboy of the Night, Trey Holston with a re-ride on Bull Frontier Coffee Ohio grounds, and he hits the eight-second mark to earn an 87 to finish tied with Sage Steele. And there goes the bull. Look out. Where's the barrel guy? Where, what happened to the barrel clown? He, like, ducked into that barrel, didn't he? Bulls going wild there. They did not win. But the Bulls did no, win. Well, the Cowboys had some Cowboys good rides last night. Like that. Coming up, people in Ohio continuing to sound off loudly about the side effects of that big train derailment, why many residents are feeling like they're being left in the dark, and why today they could get some unanswered questions. We're going to return now to that breaking news we had at the top of the hour. This is the 1800 block of Castorville Road. We're getting a a look at a dump truck, a good view of it. It looks as though the truck itself is a little bit lifted, which may be why it just took out a pedestrian bridge. Yeah, the crane is working to get that out of the way. They're working to get that road cleared. This is once again on Castorville Road, just north of 90 and a little east of the intersection of 90 and 151, if you're familiar with that area of town. We do know so far there are no injuries to report. We understand that the police has told our crew that as of right now, no injuries, no more information than what you really see, other than the fact that they are trying to get this mess cleaned up. Obviously, Castorville Road is blocked off right here. You're going to have to go around. Now we want to get to that latest on the toxic train derailment in Ohio. Officials opening a medical clinic for residents. A lot of folks are complaining of constant headaches, eye irritation after hazardous chemicals were released into the air. The Biden administration is putting pressure on the train company at the center of the investigation. The CEO promising to do right by the residents. ABC's Rena Roy with more from the scene. 
More than two weeks after the fiery train crash in East Palestine, Ohio, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg pushing for transparency and answers for residents. We are pushing forward a three-part drive on rail safety. Things that we're doing at the Department of Transportation to raise the bar, things that we need help from Congress to do in order to hold rail companies accountable, and things that this industry needs to do differently. The train company, Norfolk Southern, turning this church into a reimbursement center for affected families. The company has also put a million dollars into a recovery fund for affected residents. 11-year-old Zach lives less than a mile from the side of the derailment, his family now living in a hotel. Our face has been burning, headaches, massive, almost passing out. The company also paying for the cleanup, announcing more than seven tons of contaminated soil and over one million gallons of contaminated water have now been excavated from the derailment site. Adding in a statement, the material will be transported to landfills and disposal facilities that are designed to accept it safely. This comes as federal and state health officials open a health clinic for residents to address medical concerns after multiple complaints of skin, eye and throat irritation. They're doing everything they can to take care of the community. The governors of Ohio and Pennsylvania are both making a visit to East Palestine today, along with the EPA administrator, hoping to help residents in this long road to recovery. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. It was a tough day for students at Michigan State University. Yesterday, they returned to class one week after a gunman opened fire on campus, killing three people and wounding five others. The university's interim provost says that the community is still dealing with the shock of what happened last week, and they're hoping that students, faculty, and staff will continue to heal. Coming back into spaces that are familiar, interacting with people who are familiar, is helpful in the process of healing and grieving. We know that everybody heals at their own pace and in their own manner, and so getting it exactly right will not be possible, but we will do the best we can in support of each other. Four of the five students wounded in the shooting remain in critical condition. A fifth is in stable condition. Police say they still don't know why this gunman targeted Michigan State University. He took his own life, and it's unclear if they will ever know the answer. At least six people have been killed in Turkey following a new 6.3 magnitude earthquake. A quake coming two weeks after that massive quake killed tens of thousands. This new quake was centered in the town of Defni, which was one of the worst hit regions in the magnitude 7.8 quake that struck at the beginning of this month. In the most recent quake, four have been killed, over 200 injured. Search and rescue efforts were underway this morning in their three collapsed buildings where people are believed to be trapped. Between both quakes, over 46,000 deaths have been reported. Let's look outside because it's just too pretty not to look at it again. 78 degrees outside. We are warming up fast. Yeah, it's uh, it's going up quickly. I think we'll be in the 80s here pretty soon uh, in, into the mid 80s this afternoon. If you were up early this morning, you caught some of that fog. There was patchy fog around San Antonio. I want to take you to the uh, south, south part of Bear County and you see some of the fog that developed. It was light, wasn't a big deal, but kind of made for a a uh, beautiful morning, really. Marcelo sent that picture, and I love that with the uh, sunrise in the background. Well done. Uh, we may see a little bit more fog coming up tomorrow morning. 75 right now, Burning State, 79, Rio Medina, starting to see 80s in places like Divine and Pleasanton, where it's 82 right now, 75 in Converse. And let me take you back in history a little bit. Yes, it's warm, but it's not as warm as it was in 1996. You remember this? Got up to 100 back then on this date, back in 1996. And I made the comment earlier that that was back when the uh, Cowboys were good. I, should, I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have gone there. And David corrected me that in 1996, Cowboys were actually on their way down a little bit. But good, uh, good years back in the mid-90s, back when it was really hot. We're not going to get there, uh, but we will see some hot temperatures coming up. We'll have more on that warm forecast here in just a few minutes. Guys. Wow. That was a blast from the past. Cowboys, kind of good. All right, still ahead, we're learning the big role that members of the San Antonio Zoo played when it came to the shutdown during that really cold weather at the Austin Zoo.
new study is out. It shows that chronic pain is linked to an increased risk of cognitive decline as well as dementia. The study found that the hippocampus of the brain ages about a year in people suffering from chronic pain like arthritis, cancer, or back pain. The risk rose as the number of pain sites in the body increased. The hippocampal volume was nearly four times smaller in people with pain in five or more body sites as compared to those with only two, the equivalent of up to eight years of aging. In the United States alone, at least one in five people live with long-lasting pain, and that's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Eating disorders are a concern for all of those around the world, but especially for children. A new study shows more than one in five kids and adolescents around the world show signs of disordered eating. Experts say disordered eating is similar in behavior to an eating disorder. It can include strict food rules around how much a person eats, what they are eating, and how much they are exercising in relation to their food. Researchers reviewed and analyzed 32 studies from 16 countries and found that 22% of children and adolescents showed disordered eating behaviors. Experts say you should seek professional help if you notice signs of disordered eating in your child. Signs include an obsession with body weight or shape, distorted self-image, rigid dietary rules, binge eating, and purging behaviors. Look at outside with live cam. You know, I haven't seen the boss today. We could like go play hooky this afternoon. <laughs> this would be the day to do it. Uh, I, I think he's here. Uh oh. <laughs> you might be caught. I don't know. Uh, no, it is a perfect day for that. We got blue skies, uh, 76 so far. 57 was the low this morning, 69, 46 of the averages. So we're above average in both regards. And I mentioned that 100 degree record back in 1996. They've been as low as 30 back in 1939. Questions, how warm will we go tomorrow? We know it's gonna be pretty hot. And what fluctuations will we see the rest of the week? We do have another front to talk about. That seven day forecast is coming up. This Rodeo Remembers, powered by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. Many Texas towns have a proud cowboy past, but one town just south of San Antonio, the town of Pleasanton, has staked its claim as the birthplace of the cowboy. It's a claim that dates all the way back to 1720. Until the late 1600s, the Spanish didn't think much of the land that would become Texas. Then the French began to show an interest. So the Spanish decided to settle the Texas frontier by building the missions. How would the missions support themselves? Cattle ranching. And where would be the first mission ranch? Right in between Poteet and Pleasanton, the ranch of the Mission San Jose. And what about those cowboys? In 1821, Mexico declared independence from Spain after a costly war. In need of capital and people, the Mexican government began to encourage foreign settlers. Soon, Americans were moving to a place called Tejas. To handle the herds of this new landscape, the settlers had to learn the skills of the local vaqueros, but they needed a name. So they translated the word vaqueros into English, and so became the first cowboys. Whether the first cowboy rode through Pleasanton is anyone's guess, but by the late 1800s, Pleasanton developed a thriving cattle industry. For countless cowboys, it became a main stop on their Kansas cattle drives. As far as Pleasanton's claim, well, there are two facts at work here. Vaqueros worked the first mission ranch and Vaqueros were the first cowboys. So maybe Pleasanton is the birthplace of a cowboy. New today, we are learning the San Antonio Zoo disaster team played a huge role in helping the Austin Zoo reopen following that ice storm that hit earlier this month. The Austin Zoo posted these pictures of the damage received from that storm to their Facebook page. You can see trees torn down, debris, damage to some fencing and roofs is all happening. The zoo forced to close for six days due to the damage. The Zoological Disaster Response Rescue and Recovery Team called in to help. The ZDR3 network provides support to zoos, aquariums, and sanctuaries across the state when the natural disasters strike. Here in San Antonio, a six-person team from our zoo went to Austin to help with the cleanup. After six days, the zoo reopened for business. And speaking of that early February winter and ice storm thing that we can't seem to ever shake, Governor Abbott announcing that he is expanding the ice storm disaster declaration. And that extension is going to add 17 more counties to the original declaration. Dec 
declaration, and that is why uh, more people are going to be able to get funding. Some of those counties being added include Bastrop, Blanco, Hunt, Kendall, Leon, plus a few more. Governor Abbott saying as the damage is sustained during the storms becomes more clear, assistance and support to those communities will continue. And these 17 counties join the already seven that were on the original declaration, uh, such as Travis County, which we just talked about where the zoo is, that includes Austin. The Texas Division of Emergency Management has deployed specialized teams throughout the state in order to work with the utility providers and electric cooperative to help with the infrastructure damages we sustained and identify the potential for uh, more disaster assistance. Back to our zoo. That's why we have one of the best zoos in the entire country. Those people over there are fantastic, and it's good that they got the zoo up there they in did. Uh, Austin opened up because today would be a beautiful day to go to the zoo. It would be a perfect day. And, and by the way, the Texas Forest Service just put out that 10.5 million trees were damaged yeah. in Austin Ooh. by the ice storm. That I can believe storm. that. Just in Austin? Just in Austin alone. 30% oh. of the canopy there. So that was a it, mm. it was a ice storm for the record books. There's no doubt about it. But we're glad that we're thawing out. And you're right. Today is a great day to be out and about. Whatever plans you may have, today's a good day for it. We've had a lot of people asking us, what about the, a freeze? Do we have another one in the forecast? Is there one headed our way? Here's what I can tell you. Our average last freeze is February 24th. That's just an average, though. We can get freezes in March and even all the way into early April. Uh, but our average last freeze is February 24th. In the Hill Country, you got to get into March, March 28th in Kerrville, March 21st, Fredericksburg. So we're getting there. And temperatures certainly over the next seven to 10 days are trending warm. We know that. And it already feels that way outside. Blue skies and 76 at the airport. 77 Kelly, 75 at Randolph. South, southeast Julia winds at about 10 miles per hour. Seeing some 80s on the map in places like Rock Springs, your valley, you're up to 80 now. 86 in Carrizo Springs, you may get 90 there this afternoon. 78 Gonzales, 75 in New Braunfels and around Bear County. Getting close to 80 there in Holota, 79, 75 rained off, 76 down there in Stinson. Our forecast for today, we're thinking mid-80s here in town. Uh, again, maybe close to 90 in some of our southern counties. And then as we get into tomorrow morning, still warm. We're starting off mid-60s. That's uh, not all that cool for February. And that may come along with some fog and drizzle briefly. Brief window for that. Then the dry air kicks in, gusty ones kick in, and we're up to 87 on your Wednesday. Uh, close to 90, even in Southern Bear County, I think we could be close to 90 degrees. Uh, so tomorrow, the hottest day in our seven day forecast. Dew point trend, well, this is important too. One of the reasons we'll be so hot tomorrow is because dew points drop off. So dry air obviously cools down and heats up uh, very efficiently. And so by tomorrow afternoon with dew points in the 20s and 30s, that allows that temperature to really jump up. Not to mention, we'll have a good southwesterly wind, which is always a warming wind for us. We talked about this last half hour, but pretty impressive to see all the watches and warnings across the country. Whole western half of the United States is basically under some sort of advisory, whether it be wind, winter storm, blizzard, all the cold stuff's up here. Then we have the warm weather conditions down here, but it's uh, wind that's going to be the big issue for Texas. Some very strong winds in the Texas Panhandle tomorrow. We'll feel some of those too. Fire weather watches in effect our western counties and that's because these winds may kick up especially in the morning gusting close to 40 probably 35 ish uh, mid-morning and then the winds will slowly calm as we get into tomorrow evening but not before uh, we have that high fire danger with the uh, gustier winds especially out west so the uh, drier conditions and the lower humidity values will be out west and that's where we have extreme fire conditions i think tomorrow afternoon if not very high so uvalde lake rock springs del rio down the eagle pass but even here in san antonio the fire risk is in the high category no outdoor burning obviously we got to be really careful tomorrow anything that develops can spread very quickly and as we look at the relative humidity this is in del rio tomorrow Notice it drops off to some really low numbers, and that is what's concerning. So as we look at the extended forecast, 87 tomorrow, 79 Thursday. Front comes through, and this cools us down some. I think Friday will be our coolest day, if you want to call it that. 70, cloudy, 10% chance of some sprinkles. Mostly cloudy this weekend with 80s, and we'll get another small chance of rain coming up on Monday morning. Guys. All right, Justin, thank you. Coming up, the book one local judge has come up with to help kids who have to be in courtrooms.
Think about it. Going to the courthouse can be intimidating, especially if you're a kid. That's why one local judge decided to create a fun children's activity book to help them better understand what's going on there. The 45th Civil District Court Judge Mary Lou Alvarez coming up with this children's courthouse adventure book. It features everything from fun facts about the Vera County Courthouse, puzzles and coloring pages. It also includes all kinds of activities to help educate kids about the basics of a courthouse, a courtroom, and the role of a judge. It's just so things, the courthouse in and of itself is not such a mystery, uh, right? And so if at any point in these children's lives, if they were to come into contact with the courtroom, it's not such a scary place. This book was put together in just five days and it features Judge Alvarez and her own two kids on the cover. It's the first edition of this activity book, but the hope is to create new versions yearly. Downtown is a place you want to be. Yep. So we loaded up the truck and moved to <laughs> move to Market Square. Doesn't Market rhyme, Square. but a lot going on, and we are celebrating Mardi Gras, but not starting off how you think. Yeah, a little bit more relaxation. We have Keelan Abers with Organically Bath and Beauty here with us today. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm happy to show you how to save 25% off these amazing products I have here. 25%. Yeah. Treat right. yourself to a Mardi Gras bath bomb, and then you got to have some really good food. And Chef Butch is here with Jerk Shack. And what better for Mardi Gras than some uh, gumbo, right? That's right. Today we're going to make some gumbo yaya, no okra, collard greens. And the secret is? A really good roux, lots of time and love. Okay, and, and the best fried chicken in Ooh, the country, yes, literally. I mean, we're previewing also you the first annual too. gumbo from the... Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. gumbo uh, so competition going gumbo on. There. Then, also, there's nothing better. We're taking it to a new spot off the northeast side of town where they're serving up Mardi Gras-inspired food all year long. Need some last-minute decorations? How about Amos? Hey Gilbert! Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to show you today how this new simple item would go from this to this. What? And it's easier than you think. And adds kind of to the decoration. And if you want Fiesta decorations, boy, think about those folks. That and a whole lot more coming up on SA Live. Stick around.